headwaters of the Mississippi River is one of my favorite places in the world to go, especially early in the morning when there's no one else present. The flow of the water from the lake over the rocks into the shallow pond and then down the tiny looking creek is a place of solitude, of peace and calm, almost magical and holy. At least in the early morning at dawn or later in the evening at dusk. During the day, it's filled with children splashing, people walking over the rocks, talking, laughter, and the general buzzing of excitement. It's still a magical and holy place, but in a different way, when filled with all of those experiencing its wonder and beauty. O oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for the darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, that I know very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all the days that were formed for me, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! I try to count them. They are more than the sand. I come to the end, I am still with you. O oh, that you would kill the wicked, O God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We're finishing up our topic of prayer with Psalm 139, a psalm of thanksgiving. Last week, Pastor Chad took a deep dive into Psalm 150 and the idea of the secular and sacred coming together, commingling, looking at the whole world as sacred, as God being present in all things. Psalm 139 embodies this idea of God being present in everything. Psalm 139 is another psalm attributed to King David. Two of the more well-known verses from it are 13 and 14. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. Earlier in the psalm, David asks where we can go to flee from God's presence or where we can go away from God's spirit. And the answer is nowhere. There's nowhere we can go to be away from the presence and spirit of God, for God is everywhere all at once. No matter where we might try to flee, God is there. And God hears our prayers, no matter how small they may be, no matter where we're at in this world or what circumstances we find ourselves in. God finds us and hears us, even when we try to run and hide. It reminds me a little bit of the children's book, The Runaway Bunny, in which a small bunny tells his mother that he's going to run away from her 
and his mother tells him that no matter where he goes, she will find a way to be with him. That's God. To believe that God knows us, loves us, and will find us no matter what. How much comfort does that bring you? How much more willing are you to trust God with your deepest secrets and desires? The requests that you can't bring yourself to ask anyone else than the one who knows your inward being. It's incredibly freeing to know that no matter where you are, be it in the church, in your home, in the middle of nature, God is present and God hears our prayers. We hear multiple times in this psalm that God's thoughts are countless, that they cannot be numbered. They're as vast as the individual grains of sand in the world, and that each of us was fearfully and wonderfully made. I remember as each of my children were born, every one of them after long and difficult pregnancies, those verses came to mind. Them being fearfully and wonderfully made. The creation of each person a miracle, a mystery, a work of science and art and holiness. Pastor Shad talked about prayer being an unencumbered expression of joy. And prayer is absolutely this. Prayer is being able to utter whatever we are feeling to God at that moment and know that God will hear us, will still love us regardless of what we say in that prayer, and that God answers prayers in God's time, in God's way. Prayer is an expression of joy as well as a cry for peace and justice. The bitter weeping of a parent who has lost their child. The unburdening of the weight of responsibility and stress. Being swept with a feeling of peace. Prayer, as we have talked about in previous weeks, is one of the most brutally and beautifully honest conversations that we can have with anyone because we can be assured that no matter what we say to God, God already knows it, and God loves us and will continue to love us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. I want you to close your eyes for a moment and think about that phrase, fearfully and wonderfully made. What does being fearfully and wonderfully made mean to you? How does it change or deepen your relationship with God? I had to think about it for a while myself, and if I'm being perfectly honest, it's an ongoing conversation that I have with God. And I certainly don't expect you to have an answer right now. Maybe, though, you could find time this week to think about it. Go to a place where you can take 10 to 15 minutes to sit with no distractions. And I get that for many, that's a really hard ask. I've been on a mini vacation for the past few days with a whole stack of books that I wanted to read and I found that getting 10 to 15 minutes alone to read was pretty much impossible. But try. Try to take the time to sit and ponder. Really pray about what this means to you. If you actually believe it and what really truly believing it would do for you. I also challenge you to do this. Ask yourself, what does a good prayer look and sound like to me? And by me, I mean you. Does it look like a psalm filled with thanksgiving and praise and lament and joy? Does it look and sound like word vomit? Now, notice I didn't say, what does a good prayer look like and sound like to the world? Just to you. My idea of a good prayer for me is probably totally different than other people's. And sometimes a good prayer to me is filled with some cuss words and shouting. Now, others might find that disrespectful, and that's totally okay. I just won't cuss in front of them. And anyway, it's not to them, it's to God. Here's the thing. If we're fearfully and wonderfully made, which we are, then our version of prayer that's authentic to us, that'll be authentic to God. We've just barely scratched the surface over the past few weeks of the many characteristics of prayer and the ways of praying. As you continue on in your own prayer journey, 
remember that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, loved by our God who is everywhere and in everything, who knows our inward parts and our deepest thoughts. As you pray, pray in a way that's authentic to you. Find your holy place. God hears you. God knows you. God loves you. Amen. During the next few days, I encourage you to go deeper into the message with these two reflection questions. The first, what does being fearfully and wonderfully made mean to you? How does it change or deepen your relationship with God, believing that you are fearfully and wonderfully made? And the second, what does a good prayer look and sound like to you? Thank you.